Greetings. It's a pleasure to connect with you all. I wish I could have been there in person in Belgium, but uh, looking forward to still having a, a vigorous dialogue with you on this topic that is gaining a lot of international attention. My job in the next 10 minutes is to give you a quick primer on some research we've been doing using life cycle analysis approaches to compare metals from uh, deep sea mining of nodules and terrestrial mining. And some of these results have already been published. Some are under peer review currently. So first of all, important to lay out that uh, there are essentially five different sources of metals we can think about with reference to the green uh, transition, which we will need a lot of both for batteries and electrification of uh, cars and smart grids, uh, but also for wind power, solar power, and other emerging technologies. So you've got terrestrial sources with competing human uses, such as agriculture, you have terrestrial sources where there may be biodiversity that's compromised because you're going into forested areas. Uh, you may have also coastal mining, uh, which is taking place within national waters. Uh, this is similar to what happened with the Nautilus project that many are aware of. Uh, and then there's oceanic mining in the deep sea, which is quite noticeably different from the Nautilus project, although often in a lot of the popular uh, journalism, it's conflated. Uh, and then finally, uh, you have mining uh, being replaced by recycled sources of metals. And that should be our ultimate objective, of course, to move towards a circular economy. The question is, how do we get enough recycled stocks of those metals so that we can have that eventual transition? And all the forecasts, which we've already heard from other speakers on, uh, suggest that we do not have enough metal stocks to meet that target. And that's even coming from some of the environmental uh, groups who are uh, vehemently opposed to mining. Even they are acknowledging that for the foreseeable future, we will need to uh, invest in some level of extraction. Now, this is a map from a paper we published in the Proceedings of the Royal Society in the UK. And what it shows you is that a lot of the mining exploration projects in different stages of development for some of these important metals, like nickel particularly, are taking place in high biodiversity ecosystems on land. So when we're talking about life cycle analysis with reference to biodiversity, we have to keep in perspective that a lot of the terrestrial mining projects are in sensitive ecosystems when we're comparing them to the deep sea. So here's a comparison of uh, the known uh, resources in the deep sea uh, in comparison with economically viable reserves on land. Uh, for nickel, uh, the uh, resource base is considerable and uh, and it's more than the reserve base. We don't quite know the global terrestrial resource base. Um, and uh, important to keep in mind with reference to this is that the concentration of the, the metals in the nodules is orders of magnitude higher than the usual terrestrial uh, reserves. And that has to do with, of course, the uh, precipitation process that forms these nodules over uh, hundreds of thousands of years, which leads to very high grade deposits of those metals. So you need much less material to extract the metal from the deep sea compared to the terrestrial reserve base. Um, and converting the resource to the reserve base, of course, is a matter of when um, the ISA would be able to realistically move forward with mining. So how do we do life cycle analysis? Well, this is from a paper we published in the Journal of Cleaner Production last year, and it's just showing you a schematic that we're looking at the collection, the process itself, and the refining. So the full life cycle in that context in terms of what we're sharing so this uh, diagram shows us the research we conducted on carbon footprint comparisons published in Journal of Cleaner Production out of four peer reviews, uh, very rigorous uh, process 
And uh, for nickel, the difference is dramatic, about 80% less uh, carbon impacts from oceanic mining. Uh, and uh, cobalt, the difference is slightly less in this case, uh, but this is all very significant because some of the current arguments are around whether cobalt will be substituted, but we often forget that nickel is a very important metal also from the deep sea, and nickel seems to be quite irreplaceable in a range of different technologies uh, where uh, we're talking about the green transition. Also in this, it's important to note some of our activist friends bring up two points. One about the source of funding for research and authorship. Uh, I would submit to you that this research is peer reviewed at the highest level. That is what matters. Industry affiliation or support is of no consequence really. You have Nobel Prize winners who have worked for industry. Uh, and what matters is whether the research has been rigorously peer reviewed or not. Um, which this has. And then the other aspect of um, this is the blue carbon question uh, as to whether we are taking into account blue carbon that may be displaced from the ocean. And even oceanographers, marine scientists like Lisa Levin, uh, who have brought this up, have acknowledged that most of that blue carbon impact is in coastal areas and not in the deep sea. So we feel these numbers are quite accurate in representing the carbon footprint comparison. And to date, this is the most detailed study that's been done uh, with rigorous peer review. Uh, next, we've looked at waste comparisons in life cycle analysis. And uh, in this case, uh, we're looking at, this is the diagram which shows the nodules life cycle analysis around waste and the conventional hydro metal uh, metallurgic refinery here. So in the case of nodules, um, uh, pyrometallurgical process. And uh, this was done as well in a recent paper, which we just got accepted in the Journal of Industrial Ecology uh, after again, four peer reviews, very rigorous process. Uh, and this is going to be published in January and it's showing you the differences in terms of uh, terrestrial uh, and uh, oceanic mining. Again, there is considerable difference in the waste streams. In this case, for cobalt, the waste stream is considerably uh, different from terrestrial to, uh, to uh, marine sources of minerals. Then finally, the most contentious area is biodiversity, which of course we need to be worried about because the the deep sea does have very unique biodiversity. And we are working on a life cycle analysis paper, which is currently under peer review. Uh, and this is a, a schematic from that paper, which is comparing the ways in which we would go about comparing biodiversity, which is much more challenging because there's certain qualitative aspects where you cannot really quantify in the same way. But we're still trying our best to develop these indices uh, and to have a, a fair comparison. So what are the concerns? Clearly with hydrothermal vents, there is a huge concern uh, and sea mounts, which are the other two kinds of uh, sources of, of, uh, of uh, deep sea minerals, but that is not where the priority is right now. Uh, the polymetallic nodules is where the priority is, and that's what we need to focus on because these two, one would agree, are perhaps much more contentious in terms of biodiversity, especially sea mounts may also have issues with fisheries uh, in terms of competing uh, human uses and hydrothermal vents are indeed very unique ecosystems. So this is a diagram from the paper we are working on. Steve Katona, the co-founder of the Ocean Health Index is the lead author. The paper also has Tom Lovejoy as a co-author who is a member of the US National Academy of Sciences and is credited with actually coining the term biodiversity. And we're looking at it from this perspective in terms of species diversity, habitat diversity. One of the aspects of the deep sea we have to keep in mind is there are no plants in the deep sea. So you take out one entire layer of biodiversity. Again, we have to make tough choices. It's not to say that there may be some organisms in the deep sea which are uh, very unique, but you have to compare that with if you're going to source the metals from land, which I've already shown you in many cases is in bi high biodiversity ecosystems. 
So the question becomes, how do we unpack the precautionary principle? And that, this is what is often put forward in arguments about a moratorium. But the reality is the precautionary principle, going back to the Agenda 21 and the Earth Summit, uh, it is not meant to be a, an impasse principle. There are some clear guidelines which IUCN laid out in 2007. And if you look at them, what they say is that you have to have a systems perspective in applying the precautionary principle. You cannot just say precaution for one ecosystem. And that's why a life cycle analysis approach is so important when considering the precautionary principle. You have to compare land and terrestrial sources and the alternative. So ultimately our goal should be a circular economy. And this is where I find it quite refreshing that the deep sea mining companies are actually talking about a complete transition to a circular economy. They have in fact laid this out. This is from the metals company and their uh, business model is to move towards a complete circular economy once they have enough stock of metals. So they don't want to go on mining in perpetuity. They want just enough metal so there's enough stock for batteries so that the batteries can then be recycled and they would get into the recycling business. And you could have uh, ways in which you can track that, of course, using blockchain and so on uh, as appropriate so that you can make sure that the metals are going through the circular supply chain. Now, of course, the SDGs are very much on the agenda of policymakers, including in Europe. And this is a diagram prepared by Samantha Smith, uh, which lays out the ways in which seafloor minerals can contribute to the SDGs. So, of course, SDG 12 is foremost, but um, keeping in mind that the way in which this extraction process could be carried out uh, could also contribute to several other SDGs as well. Now, this is from some work we did in 2014, published in the Proceedings of the National Academy with colleagues at the University of Queensland. And what it shows you is that ultimately this becomes an issue of, of the calculus of consent. Uh, you know, conflict is mediating basically the relationship between business risk and social risk. And uh, we have to keep this in perspective that there are conflicts across the board in mining projects from terrestrial mining to deep sea mining. And we have to, as policymakers, step back and consider the systems approach rather than being easily torn in one direction or the other. One of the other ways in which I have looked at this issue is uh, through how mineral enterprise should be considered. And this is a, a model we developed with the Columbia Center on Sustainable Investment uh, where we're looking at essentially, we call it the smart mineral enterprise development model. And what we're looking at is public-private partnerships, which are in black. We have orange is the private sector and green is the role of government. So the role of national labs and government agencies in making sure that the research is done uh, for appropriate green tech uh, materials, which could be new materials, there could be some alternatives found, and there's good communication with the suppliers. So this model, what it does is provides a better coupling between the supply and the demand. And then you have the financing sector, you have the environmental and social risk certification mechanisms, which are all tightly intertwined. And the circular economy uh, forecasts, critical uh, assessments are all part of the public-private partnership. Thanks for your time. Uh, these are some details about our program at the University of Delaware in the US. And we also have an online platform for sharing knowledge called mineralchoices.com, which you're welcome to visit and uh, join uh, the, the newsletter. And we hope to grow this in partnership with uh, various natural history museums uh, so that we can have a much broader dialogue on this with society. Thank you.